started watching now the recording. <laughs> so my computer might slow down every now and again. Um, I will try to jump back and wait for the internet to come back if, if that ever happens. Don't um, worry, it happens. I'll turn off my camera just to make also the connection a bit lighter for everyone participating. But I'm around. If something comes up, just shout. So, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. okay. It's already a bit slow. That's okay. So, oh, as someone's put on on the chat, it's. Taxonomist Appreciation Day. Yeah, thank you for reminding us. Happy Taxonomist Appreciation Day to all of the taxonomists in the group. Right now, included. <laughs> oh, happy Botanist Appreciation Day to everyone on the group. Okay, good. We can see the presentation now. Great. Have fun. Tell us all about it. OK, so thank you so much again for inviting me to give a presentation. I'm really excited to share my brainstorming ideas for my PhD. Uh, as I mentioned it earlier, I started my PhD last October. I haven't even met my lab. Um, I haven't uh, got close to Papua New Guinea um, yet, but I do hope to go soon. So in this talk, I'm going to talk a bit about my background a bit about Papua New Guinea and then uh, about my PhD hopes and dreams. And there's some noise of. Yeah, I just maybe I've started, a spoon. I've started muting people. <laughs> OK, <laughs> don't okay. worry. I'm, we'll keep we'll keep an eye on that. Don't worry. OK, no worries. Um, yes, and I am at the University of Southampton in the UK and I'm coming to you from Wales today. So uh, I started uh, even before going to university to uh, work with uh, invasive plants and biocontrol agents at CABI in the UK. Uh, then uh, I was going through a rebellious phase when I wanted to become a marine biologist. So I enrolled at Anglia Ruskin University uh, studying part time marine biology. Um, in Cambridge was working full time, but I continued to work with plants from 2015. I worked at the National um, Institute of Agricultural Botany with uh, crop variety trials, with oilseed rape, uh, cereals and pulses. And in 2017, I got a, a scholarship to go to Nepal and I lived with farmers and I visited the Ministry of Agriculture and Kabi's plant wise program. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically a network of plant clinics where farmers can bring a dying potato and a plant doctor identifies them. Um, and after that trip, um, I flew back to Cambridge and within 48 hours, I, I reapplied to study plant biology because I, I just had to work with plants in the end. Um, so because of um, uh, a bit of a government um, support. I chose Aberystwyth University in Wales and I worked with brambles or wild blackberries um, during my undergraduate um, research. And I combined um, image analysis with phylogenetic analysis and I debunked a 150 year old um, classification system that was reliant on morphology. Um, so again, very happy Taxonomist Day. Um, I, I, I really love taxonomy um, and my taxonomist supervisor is uh, always trying to pull me back towards taxonomy in the end. Um, and in 2017, I actually became an ESPB Convivrant Scholar um, and it's a virtual kind of mentorship program and I really recommend it. If you have any PhD students, um, you can apply from anywhere in the world. Um, and that uh, scholarship kind of allowed me to uh, get a, a 
part-time job um, to work with social media and digital communications on the online platform called Plante. Um, I built up um, the social media presence and uh, within a year we went uh, to reach one to three million people just on social media about plant science news. Um, so um, uh, Anna has kind of uh, mentioned that I'm really big on science communication and uh, I'm, I'm really big fan of social media so feel free to tweet during this talk. And yes, I think yeah, great. I think I think we need you on this group. <laughs> we, I think we need you here. Let's talk after your seminar. <laughs> oh, definitely. Chat. No, I'm, I'm really happy to. Um, I, I look after a lot, a lot of Twitter accounts out there, so you never know. Oh, God. Um, no, let's not overwhelm you. But I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Thank well you. done. <laughs> um, in 2018, I actually got to uh, work at the University of Arkansas with Downing Mildew and Fusarium Wilt um, in um, America. Then I got to spend a month in at Erie in the Philippines. So I continued to work with farmers and plant diseases, different crops, um, and I pursued uh, a project uh, at the University of Exeter to work with banana diseases such as uh, Fusarium wilt, tropical race four. But um, because of COVID hit, uh, I basically spent a year doing like spatial mapping and uh, theoretical mathematical uh, modeling of um, plant disease density buildup and beneficial microbes and such. So I have a, a really um, strange kind of background coming from marine biology, then switching to plants afterwards. So let's go to Papua New Guinea. It's called the land of unexpected. And I think PhDs are called uh, land of unexpected as well. So if you combine the two, it's, uh, it's a challenge. Um, and the first thing that might come into your mind uh, when you hear um, about Papua New Guinea is that David Attenborough actually wrote about it, that um, when he was a young lad and was starting out, they went to Papua New Guinea in search of birds of paradise. Uh, and uh, when they came across some tribal uh, communities, he just went up there and just shook their hands. Uh, but the whole film crew were uh, terrified because I think they, they they did practice or previously practiced cannibalism over there. Um, so there's a lot of amazing uh, diversity in terms of uh, you know, local communities and also biodiversity. Uh, last year, this paper came out, which was absolutely fantastic in nature that um, New Guinea uh, has the world's richest island flora in the world. And Papua New Guinea has the third largest rainforest area in the world as well. But despite all this diversity that's there, um, little research is going on actually. And most of the research in Papua New Guinea is actually carried out by social scientists rather than, um, you know, ecologists or agronomists. Um, despite all this biodiversity as well, uh, Papua New Guinea has the fourth most number of under five um, year old stunted children in the world as well. So it's, um, you know, that they're really um, uh, important food security issues as well. And um, there's little governmental support going on. There are two roads in the country, basically. Um, and it's really hard to reach people. So there's a lot to do in that country. So let's talk about sweet potatoes. Um, it could be called the land of sweet potatoes. Uh, it was estimated that uh, people in rural areas, which uh, are supposed to be about 80-85% of the whole population of Papua New Guinea, um, that people eat almost 700 kilograms of sweet potatoes per year. and um, so everyone grows sweet potatoes continuously, but also there is a lot of diversity of sweet potatoes in Papua New Guinea. Uh, again, this is just an estimate that there might be over 5,000 land races that farmers grow, and what, over 1,000 um, accessions are maintained at uh, national germplasm collections that haven't really been um, utilized. 
Uh, so sweet potato people um, know of the, uh, that sweet potatoes arrived in Polynesia uh, pre-human times and uh, the two chloroplast big groups from uh, Central and South America. And uh, this paper from 2013 was kind of like the, the biggest study that looked at um, 400 accessions of sweet potatoes uh, with molecular markers and they have found that um, most of them were uh, chloroplast 2, but they could be found in the lowland areas, whereas chloroplast 1 members uh, could be found in the highlands. And overall, they said that the genetic diversity was a bit lower than in um, Central and uh, South American regions. But it is really interesting how these two um, um, environments seem to really uh, differ in terms of the the, um, the genetic makeup of sweet potatoes. And not only that, but these two uh, lowland and highland areas, uh, the community structures really differ as well. And um, in the lowlands, there is low density uh, population because of malaria. So most people do um, live in the highlands and they grow sweet potatoes for up to 2,800 meters usually. To look at how it's all cultivated, um, and Arthur has given a fantastic talk last week about roots, and I thought that this was a really interesting one that I've come across. Um, I don't know if you can see the name of this paper, sorry. Uh, it's from um, Australians. They put together this collection of articles of soil fertility and sweet potato based cropping systems in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. And uh, this um, article, they didn't mention too much about the experiment, but they said that if they would plant them horizontally or vertically, the roots would grow really differently. Um, I don't know if this is something that people have looked into before. Um, and some communities practice this kind of um, soil management practice that they pile up organic matter, they cover it with soil, and they make these mounds uh, to control for soil moisture, um, which look um, really unique um, overall. And I have to mention that I, in, in the talk as well, uh, in the title, I mentioned Sweden agriculture. And it is because most of the population practices with an agriculture in Papua. And cultivating crops on it and for a couple of years and then leaving it fallow so it can regenerate. And after a couple of decades, they clear it again in a cycle. And this big black box um, is out there in PNG in terms of yield variability. Um, I've talked to an Australian professor who has worked in PNG for uh, since the 60s, and he was the first person who started uh, working with MPK fertilizers and looked at um, yields, um, uh, you know, closely. And he said that even after many, many decades, he still has no idea what, what is the main component. If it is the soil fertility, the soil moisture, rainfall, seasonality, varieties, there's just so much diversity in habitats in PNG. And um, overall, people do say that there's this big, big uh, difference in uh, yield uh, between new gardens and old gardens. So the old gardens are usually um, like two or three year old uh, gardens that have been cleared. Um, and there's this rapid decline in yield. And in terms of um, plant diseases on sweet potatoes, there aren't too many surveys. Um, there are lots of problems. Everyone I talk to, they say that, yes, we can see that there is something going on, but there aren't too many plant pathologists working in PNG. Um, this survey by Jeff Gurr uh, was really, really great to kind of ask farmers uh, what sort of um, pests they see on uh, sweet potatoes and 
all of them reported something. They kind of say that in Old Garden that there are a couple more problems, uh, but overall people do not practice any kind of disease control method. And I should say that even in terms of fertilizers, people don't really use it um, because it's either not available or available in cities or people just don't know how to apply it to begin with. So I'm really interested in, um, you know, PNGs, biodiversity and food security. And in terms of biodiversity, um, I talked about all the, the, the amazing um, flora, uh, flora and uh, forests and everything. And um, according to this global forest watch, which is based on remote sensing, uh, most of the deforestation in Papua New Guinea is due to shifting agriculture. And this creates this mosaic of landscape of cleared and uh, regenerating plots. Um, there, there are these lots of papers that say that slash and burn agriculture in Sweden or shifting cultivation is leading to you know 5.5 million hectares of deforestation per year but no one can actually um, estimate it properly or actually quantify the impact um, there was one paper that said that over 100 million people practice Sweden agriculture in the world uh, but it's it's really hard to um, estimate and to actually know if, is it actually sustainable, you know, or is it actually expanding into primary forest areas with population growth? Um, and that, there are many, many questions. And I think this whole landscape uh, is, is really fantastic to study with remote sensing. So I am doing a bit of that and I will share that with you in a second. Um, in terms of PNG and deforestation, 1.5 million hectares of tree cover was lost um, in the last two decades overall. So my PhD hopes and dreams kind of can be categorized into three team, uh, things really. One is about looking at biodiversity, modeling biodiversity and using remote sensing to look at all this um, landscape change. The second is actually looking at the Sweden cycle and um, soil treatments and focusing on underlying factors with uh, metagenomics. And the third one is how to utilize this sweet potato diversity um, with uh, farmers working closely together with them. So um, again, there is a link on, on the university's website um, that kind of um, sums up what my PhD is supposed to be about. Uh, and uh, it sounds like I'm uh, going to change the world, of course, in the next uh, three and a half years. Um, and I thought I would walk you through it. And these are, again, just lots of ideas. I haven't been to PNG. I've been planning everything in front of my screen. Um, and. I will definitely see which one I can explore further during my PhD. So the first one would be just this modeling bit and remote sensing first gains and losses. The second, a bit of plant pathology because I need to do something with plant diseases. Um, and actually um, looking at crop diversity and this plant pathogen load um, uh, across an altitudinal gradient in PNG um, because along this transect uh, my lab has worked there before and they found that over 90 crops are grown in the different gardens uh, so there's a lot of on-farm diversity itself um, and I will talk a bit this plant disease load uh, um, on the next slide I think. Um, the, the big big project is the soil management bit to actually look at the Sweden cycle, what's happening to uh, nutrient um, cycling related uh, gene abundances and uh, how can we change the, uh, these with different um, uh, practices. And the fourth one would be this um, nutritional value and working with um, the, the National Germplasm Collection. I'm sure that 
uh, out of these objectives. All the sweet potatoes are rooting for objective four. That let's look at genetic diversity. Um, I'm in an ecology group, so um, we do have an underutilized crop uh, center at the University of Southampton, and um, the professor there would really like me to go that way as well. But my main supervisors are all ecologists, so they, they really like the soil metagenomics and all the other bits. So I'm being pulled a bit, <laughs> um, whichever is possible in the future. Uh, so at the moment, I have done this uh, biodiversity mapping. Uh, there are over a million observations reported in Papua New Guinea for different um, taxa. And from the good observational data and building these species distribution models one by one uh, using different uh, algorithms. This is just with one maxent and using about 20 climatic variables. And I'm stacking these up, but because there are so many of them, I'm actually running everything on a supercomputer um, and we're having uh, data leakage problems on on my supercomputer folder, which I have, um, you know, um, admin people are helping me with. But this is kind of like with 60 species, how it would look like that I've stacked uh, on top of each other, the different species distribution models. And on to this one, um, there is the global forest watch data on deforestation, so I can layer up where the deforestation is happening and gaining and basically calculating area um, where it's shifting. And I'm going to be working in this village, Ohu, um, and you can kind of see already the landscape change um, from the planet database, which has been made available for researchers back in September 2020 with collaboration with the Norwegian government, actually. This is the, the latest, um, most um, uh, highest resolution data set ever available for researchers below five meters. Um, and basically this picture would be coming from August when most of the gardens are cleared. And this picture is from December when everything kind of um, starts growing back. And uh, currently I'm doing a remote sensing course and I'm playing with um, how to track um, each of these plots and uh, with NDVI, maybe I, sh I could actually pinpoint when that plot has been cleared so I can look at this dynamic uh, landscape. For plant disease load and crop diversity, there is that um, transect. Um, and I would love to work with plant diseases. Um, there are so many of them. Um, one of the biggest problems is the uh, coconut and banana phytoplasma disease. Uh, but everyone who has ever worked with it told me that like I need to be in a specialized lab with lots of people who have worked with that disease for a long time. Um, and uh, I'm going to be based at uh, Binatang um, Research Center, which is mostly focused on entomology and ecology. So they don't have the facilities to, to work properly with um, molecular tools in the country. Um, so I've come across this paper um, that actually comes up with a really smart way of uh, grouping um, um, disease uh, symptoms like, okay, leaf spot, powdery mildew, rust, um, taking a picture, calculating the area of, um, uh, of the disease, then taking into account how many disease symptoms are in the plot and how many crops are there, and looking at uh, if like the on crop diverse uh, on farm crop diversity uh, has an impact on uh, disease severity uh, and I literally uh, just before this meeting I, I've got the email that I've got a grant to do this uh, which is really really exciting so I'm, I'm really happy to do this um, congratulations we just ah, have to interrupt congratulations <laughs> thank you so, <laughs> it was a really nice way wow. I was just messaging my supervisors before I logged on to this meeting. I've got it. Oh, yeah, that's what we're here for. When you're finished, we can all just clap and celebrate with you. Thank Grab you so much. Or something. <laughs> Go ahead. <sorry. laughs> Thank you. No, I, I'm also really, really happy because um, we need a lot of money for, to do this. Uh, and I keep looking for places to get small grants. Um, so let's dive into the, to the, the big soil management one. 
It builds on to a previous research by Miriam at the University of Oxford, who has been co-supervised by my first supervisor, Becky Morris. And she basically uh, did uh, these soil experiments uh, using different fertilizers um, in uh, new and old gardens, growing uh, one um, type of um, one land race of uh, sweet potato and uh, in that Ohu village that you saw on the remote sensing uh, slide. And uh, she really brilliantly basically also combined this soil data, yield data, but also um, did tasting after the experiment, uh, which treatment do farmers really like. Um, and they, for example, the chicken manure led to a bit of yield increase, but they really didn't like the taste. They just wouldn't eat it. Um, but with MPK fertilizer was sort of the best um, treatment in there. Uh, and she is publishing this really soon. But um, I hope to continue her work um, in this village. Um, but there's also a lot of responsibility because uh, she said that uh, she also tried um, the banana peel treatment. And farmers really loved it. They they thought it was a brilliant idea. Um, it didn't really increase the yields, but everyone started doing it. So there's also um, a responsibility what we're doing with the farmers that uh, you know even if I'm I'm running an experiment for for a couple of months and leave, maybe you know they will start using the one that I've been experimenting with, and it wasn't the right one. So. Um, uh, it's going to be a fun project. Uh, at the beginning of my PhD, I've written a review paper and uh, basically looking at below ground processes throughout the Sweden system. And um, even in, in this fire phase, there isn't too much research done um, what's happening in the rainforest. It's mostly coming out from um, the Amazon that people actually look at what's happening when, when big forest patches are being cleared. Um, and when thinking about garden types as well, um, especially in Papua New Guinea, you would have like a, a, a garden that's continuously grown, um, you know, sweet potatoes are continuously grown. Then you have one garden where there are cash crops. Then when these yields are decreasing, they sort of transition into this vegetable garden. Uh, and after a number of years, they abandon it. And that's the fellow one. So it's, there's just, like from an ecologist point of view, there's so much going on and every system is really, really different. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is to focus on the Sweden cycle with soil metagenomics and uh, on soil treatments. I'm going to zoom in to these. Um, so within the Sweden cycle, I'm hoping to compare um, what's happening in the primary, what's in the soil in the primary first before clearing, after clearing, then two or three weeks after clearing. So seeing like what colonizers might be building up in the soil after um, the whole clearing event. And after that, um, looking at uh, fallowed fields, um, probably at five completely different locations, uh, because I, I'm not gonna have too much time to wait for years for for the fallowed um, land. Um, and there are certain things to think about if we want to actually compare primary and secondary forest, like what's in the soil to begin with. Um, do we want to actually compare, you know, um, how old the fallowed fields will be and such. And um, in terms of um, sample sizes, it has been really interesting. And I don't know if, if anyone has any experience with soil metagenomics. Um, it's really interesting that most publications do work with five biological um, uh, replicates. Uh, like that, there are big publications out there that five biological replicates here, five biological replicates there, and they compare it and that's it. And I think as ecologists, we are again keep thinking like we need more more replications, but everything becomes really really expensive. Um, so we need to be really smart about like what we're picking. And in terms of why soil metagenomics, it's because we want to focus on, like, it's going to be a black box already in Papua New Guinea, what's in the soil. And soil metagenomics can look at gene abundances, 
which have functions. And that's what I'm really interested in uh, to pick out about 100 genes. Uh, I've been picking them out um, related to different functions, especially for nutrient cycling um, and um, such as nitrogen fixation as well. And uh, with plant health, um, plant growth promoting uh, um, functions as well. And these papers are absolutely fantastic that show what can be done. Um, from 2019, this one was looking at long-term uh, fertilizer input and how um, different uh, um, functionality genes completely changed based on different inputs and what changed. Uh, in this one, they compared um, the soil microbial network in primary first, pasture and secondary first, and basically just taking apart what's happening in the soil um, in terms of the, the microbes um, themselves. And then with uh, the soil treatments, oh, this was really big when I started the whole project. We wanted to compare highlands and lowlands and new and old gardens and let's have four treatments. But um, I included here that like as the samples go up, everything, all the costs go up. And I haven't found too many publications who used over 25 samples because one sample is going to give me 15 gigabytes of data to swift through and make sense of. So um, again, this is something that I'm cu currently thinking of. And if anyone has any suggestions how to go about picking the, the right um, number of treatments and such, it, it would be most welcome. Um, here we're thinking of doing five gardens three treatments when it's control, MPK fertilizer and soil transplantation. Soil transplantation is of particular interest um, because my supervisors have worked with it and in Europe especially, um, it has enormous potential in soil regeneration having long-term effects uh, that uh, only a, a bit of topsoil is um, moved from like a, a local primary forest uh, and it can lead to, it could lead to um, decades long change. But all this research has been carried out in Europe when they talked about habitat restoration and such. Um, so this would be like the very first time to try out this sort of transplantation um, in the tropics. Uh, it comes with the responsibility again that uh, what if we tell people that just take a bit of soil from from the rainforest that might not be good if, if everyone starts, starts to do it, but um, it's highly unlikely. Um, so again, this is something that we, we keep in mind and keep on thinking and in terms of um, sampling um, before in the Sweden cycle, I would use this geo grid. Um, uh, sampling design for the right uh, for the sweet potato ones. We would use uh, rhizosphere samples um, with the three treatments. Use spillover plants, uh, and we would have the T zero uh, rhizosphere samples. So this would be destructively collected. Um, I'm also a really big fan of bokashi because that's kind of the whole biological control agents come in um, to actually ferment beneficial microbes, molasses, you know, on farm resources, or it can be called vermi wash if it's anaerobic, um, and it can be relatively simple. Um, but it might be again too novel and something that maybe farmers wouldn't really take up. So that's something that we're keeping in mind, but um, maybe we, we won't be uh, trying that one out. And Throughout the whole PhD, I think what our lab has been really spot on is that we we do work with social scientists and we do uh, look at, you know, throughout the experiments, we, we work together with farmers, we work on their lands, they look after these experimental gardens um, and we really want to make sure that it is helpful. And I would like to highlight this um, article that was published last year, it was a really big machine learning study. Uh, they screened over 100,000 nature related publication uh, on uh, agriculture related topics. And they found that only like 5% actually uh, 
tested something that would have been useful for smallholder farmers. Um, and they found that even less actually tested existing practices. Um, like everyone was saying that, oh, if you bring in a tractor and you do all of this, then, you know, every, uh, you know all the farmers will um, uh, you know, make more food and like they will be happy. And then, you know, after the research is done, they leave and, and no one picks it up. So in terms of the, the soil experiments as well, um, maybe we, we, we won't be going for the soil transplantation. We keep thinking. It's ecologically really interesting, but um, it should be useful for the farmers. And I will be um, uh, tracking the knowledge, attitude and skills cows of farmers who are working with the um, on the experimental gardens, also the local communities and outside the communities. If people are, you know, um, liking these experiments, like are they taking up soil management practices? What do they prefer? Um, and is this knowledge spreading outside the communities we work with? And the final uh, project plan, which is again the sweet potato one, uh, it is about the diversity and like how is how are you know the, these land races selected and even the you know the social scientists are really interested as well that um, how, how are they selecting some of them? Like, would they actually, like if, if you come up with one that's like, oh, twice the yield, would they actually, you know, start saying that, okay, we will grow it just for the yield or they just won't like the taste and they won't grow it. Um, and if I can uh, look at these germplasm collections, um, I would be looking at genetic diversity and also this paper was fantastic last year that they have come up with SNPs for um, uh, really relevant um, properties like dry matter storage, beta carotene, flesh color and total uh, root yield. And we could actually look at like high um, in highlands and lowlands, like are they selecting for like a particular um, characteristic? Um, but I think this whole project idea is that I go out there in the germplasm collections, get a, a bit of sample, ship it back and, and sample it here. So this plan is more, if 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 I can, if I cannot spend too much time in Papua New Guinea, it would be good. But um, again, we would work together with farmers afterwards and definitely disseminate it. And uh, hopefully it would be again, really useful. Um, it would be fantastic. Um, so all feed back is very welcome on all these ideas. Um, again, I've been planning everything in front of a screen. I talked to a lot of people who have been working in Papua New Guinea, um, but I'm pretty sure once I go out there, I will look at these plans. And I will be like, oh, yeah, um, what was I thinking? <laughs> but um, hopefully it will be useful. And if you would like to learn a little bit more about brambles and bananas, I have a couple more slides, but I will leave it um, until the last bit. So thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, that, that was there's quite a lot in there <laughs> to discuss. <laughs> yeah, um, that was that. No, that was fantastic. And again, so clearly presented and, and just so easy to follow. Um, I always say this, it's so hard to have all these different presentations and I, I always appreciate uh, everyone who presents just making an effort to, to, to make the content accessible to everyone to tell the story in an easy way. We've been so lucky in that sense and uh, you have also managed to do this. So thank you for making it just easier to follow. Someone does not work with sweet potato. Um, and some very interesting points in there, you know, from the scientific and from economic and sociological point of view. So let me just see if anyone has any questions. Has anyone been? Oh, Arthur, yes. <laughs> I, I, I have to go first, right? Yes. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. Not an expert Arthur here, so. <laughs> Um, well, uh, that sounds like exciting work, Juniper. Congratulations on your grant and best of luck with the work. Um, Got two points, two points for now. So number, the first point is that 
Um, you cited the work by Hughes, Michael. I actually worked with him. I had a project in Australia and oh, very okay. nice guy. So he actually stayed in PNG for several years. When Aussies go there, they call them lost in the bush because they pretty much get lost there. So, but he actually worked with counterparts in PNG um, doing agronomic work. I also work with colleagues in Queensland, uh, Department of Ag, that also look at viruses in sweet potatoes in, in PNG. So it might benefit your work in the long term and short term to interact with those guys, with the, with the folks in Queensland, because they've got a lot of history working with PNG, sweet potatoes, agronomy, and especially the diseases part. And another point that I, I'd like to make is that David Minimba, I don't know if uh, you've reached out to him, I hosted him here in Louisiana. He's from PNG. He did work on sweet potato exudates, and it was quite interesting work because he actually was measuring exudates in roots in response to the presence or absence of phosphorus, which you mentioned in your work. And basically, what his data showed was that uh, root systems of sweet potatoes respond to phosphorus by releasing exudates, which makes phosphorus more available. So part of the reason why there's a different uh, land raises there is because um, obviously many of those gardens, they do not fertilize, they do not put phosphorus. So the best performing cultivars are the ones that, or land raises are the ones that don't require much phosphorus. So the moment you introduce like inorganic fertilizers like NP and K, they might actually low, you know, go produce lower so what he did was compared Beauregard, which is a variety developed here, which was developed with high input, you know, systems, and then he compared it with uh, two land races there, and he found very interesting results. So that might factor in in your work, because part of the part of the reason why there's a lot of land races there is because they practice slash and burn, and the end did a very good uh, work back in the 80s and 70s to show that. The, the actual burning of the land actually makes all those seeds sprout. <laughs> wow. That's why when they go back and the farmers see all this new seed sprouting, it's the burning thing. Because it, apparently, you know, you, you obviously know that it's very hard to scarify the root, the seed coat of the seed potato. But once it becomes, you know, exposed to burning, they sprout. And that's part of the reason why there's so much diversity in PNG because of the Sweden system. So if, if you do away with that, they might lose access to that diversity. So, you know, but um, I think those are just the main points I'd like to make. There's a few more, but I can go talk all day about this. But anyway, I'm going to stop there. But best of luck with the work. Oh, thank you so, so much. Uh, can you tell me his name again, David? Uh, David Minemba, M-I-N-E-M-B-A. He did his PhD in Australia. I think he finished it last year and published his results I think in Sanjay Horticulture, it's one of the horticulture journals. Yes, and uh, <laughs> the the PhD advisor you work with was really an expert on root exudates. I think she's in Western Australia, quite quite a ways, but it may be in your future to visit Australia, <laughs> cross the street oh. and swim across. So anyway. <laughs> yes, no, thank you so much. I will definitely look up his work and uh, it is just super interesting, isn't it? That, that they're just, so different and like again you know exudates <laughs> and yeah, exudates impact the soil microbial community see mm -hmm. and it helps to connect all the dust there may be data points that you can't explain why this cultivar i mean land race responding differently well if you don't factor in exudates then you lose part of that that's the part of the story that many people fail to tell is because it's a challenge to measure exudates we've tried and we failed <laughs> but but they have capacity there, and I, I guess in the UK there's also capacity to do that. But I, I, it's going to add more to your work. But it, you know, just give it a thought, look up, look up on it, and it will help you tell the narrative better once you explain it in terms of what root systems respond to in in low and P. And apparently, I've been looking at the references cited. Uh, that is excellent uh, work there, but it's in the action of the nitrogen and phosphorus that affects soil microbial communities. And, and that's really a good narrative. You know, uh, obviously these systems are low input system. There's a reason for that. Because over these years, the sweet potato land races adopt to it by releasing exudates and a few other 
mechanism. So the moment you introduce inorganic fertilizers, they may actually, you know, yield lower or perform mm -hmm. you know, you know, worse. So anyway, I'm oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Arthur. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> Jennifer. Do you want to, do you want to add something to that or? Oh gosh, so much. You know, <laughs> it's uh, when you mentioned you know all the phosphorus bed. Um, so in Miriam's work, I know that uh, she tried you know the banana peels. Uh, that was supposed to be the phosphorus one, and there wasn't too much of a difference. But she also found that in the soil itself. They were mostly uh, nitrogen uh, limited, so phosphorus wasn't that big of a problem. Um, and again, you know, when you think about the tropical um, rainforest as well, uh, it's mostly nitrogen limitation that's the the big problem, um, which is a whole other thing. I've been like really obsessed with you know um, legume uh, crop rotation because that's something that they do use. They do uh, use peanuts. But apparently they don't eat it. They don't like it. Uh, they just feed it to the pigs. Um, that's the same with winged beans as well. That you know you see these publications that winged beans is the future, and then everyone's like they don't eat it because it's not nice. Um, David actually stayed at home. I hosted him for two nights, and he said, in PNG, if in, if you can grow sweet potatoes and and raise pigs, you've made it. You can be a chief. So <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. So, of sweet potato. <laughs> Not like elsewhere. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions? Oh, Lloyd. Yes. Go ahead, Lloyd. Hi, good morning. Morning, uh, Well done, Jennifer. Here um, on your grant and, and your success so far in, in preparing for your PhD. Um, I, I just wanted to ask about the, the planting methods that are used in Papua New Guinea. I thought it was very interesting in how they use mounds to plant the potatoes. I don't think I've ever seen that um, for potatoes. I've seen it for, um, for, for yams, and they normally use the stake. Um, in the center of the mound to like let the vines run up, but I've never seen the potatoes all on a mound laying on laying around. So um, I don't know if you would, would be able to speak a little bit more on that cultural practice, or, or even uh, the idea of planting it vertically or horizontally to let the roots grow in different formation. Yeah, thank you so much for the question, Lloyd. Um, so th this horizontal and vertical stuff I've literally come across it just after Arthur's uh, talk that I was like I remember something in the package of articles um, I, I have never asked anyone like how do you place the sweet potato uh, planting material in like I don't know Arthur do they usually they usually use vertical Arthur knows the answer yes he yeah <laughs> Um, I was in the middle of Ethiopia in the mountains and we asked the farmer, how do you plant your sweet potato? And the farmer said, we're planting it this way, flat. So <laughs> anyway, um, in Australia, they did a lot of research and they found out that planting it flat or horizontally yields more uh, uniform roots. And in terms of the economic uh, incentives, it actually uh, produces more. So if Again, another reason to go to Australia. Uh, if you go to Australia, it's they're all planted horizontally mm -hmm. or you know flat. So, and I think most of that is coming from the Aussie work, you know, in PNG. So, and the mounds, um, actually, it's a practice in 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 the Pacific, in Hawaii. Uh, the traditional planting is mounds. Uh, I, I think in New Zealand as well. Um, some of the traditional Maori um, sites they use mounds. So it's. It's not only in PNG, but it's a Pacific thing, that uh, that area there. So it's quite interesting. Uh, I think in the oh, in the uh, when sweet potato was first grown, they were grown in swamps because taro was being displaced, and so in swamps they had those mounds, right? And so obviously sweet potatoes cannot survive where taro is, so they have to build up. And so I guess, I guess over time they realized that it's better to grow them in mounds rather than putting them, you know, where the taro used to grow. 
Yeah, it's it's really cool, isn't it? It's yeah. like, oh, let's put them horizontally and they actually grow better. And you think that you you want to put a plant like vertically and like, yeah, uh, yeah plants are great. Uh, there's quite a bit, uh, yeah, uh, there's quite a bit of work in Queensland. So again, like I really suggest you make one or two stuff in Australia. Do you know what? I've been invited uh, by Australian professors to go, but at the moment, Australia is not letting any international students in, like probably for the next year, um, which is going to be ridiculous because I um, like I'm going to fly through Brisbane and I'm going to transit through and I cannot leave the airport and I will be there, which is, uh, but um, no, there's, uh, again, coming back to the mounds as well, I would have to say that, um, you know, I asked the people we work with and they said that, you know, in those communities, they don't practice it. Um, so there is a, a bit of um, uh, a few reports that they are happening in the highlands and uh, the one that we are going to work with is in the lowlands because um, like this is again a big decision in terms of like our, our, our sampling designs, but most uh, papers and research does focus on highland uh, environments and everything because that's where most people are. But that means that they have left out the lowlands. Like you, you cannot really found, find too many things what's, what's happening in the lowlands and you know, uh, what will happen in the future. Um, and uh, again, malaria is, is the main issue in terms of the, the lowland populations in Papua New Guinea. Um, but I'm sure that if when I get to go and the more people I meet, they will have all these different um, uh, cultivation methods. I know that they also use um, nitrogen fixing trees um, usually um, and this crop rotation is, is the main uh, practice but they don't really add anything to the soil um, usually. Any other questions? I would like just to say maybe we can invite those people from Queensland to join us and just give a talk. Yeah. yeah, that would be cool. Because then we can. I yeah. Can do yes. Um, oh, thank you, Arthur. Yeah. Yes. Do that. Yeah. Yeah. Then we can have a chat and and exchange some ideas. And even if Juniper can't go in person, then at least they can get to chat and. Yeah. Uh, I was supposed to go there for my project like the last year. I supposed to go three mm -hmm. times. I did not do that. And they tried to send me a care package. They had rum and they had kangaroo, uh, <laughs> kangaroo meat. And it did it. They they get shipped back because obviously we oh. don't take you know rum and kangaroo meat in our package here. So, oh well, oh. hopefully uh, I'm actually looking at the participants, and my father is on the call, and ah. he's he's a <laughs> plant pathologist in Australia. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I will get to Australia at some point, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Well, welcome, Juniper's father. Make yourself at home. <laughs> Thank oh, you for dear. joining us. <laughs> well, it's good. He can celebrate with us as well. Your grant. Um, oh, spotlighted video. What, what's going on? And it's related to plant pathology. So, you know. Oh, right. OK. It's. Uh, oh. so, I, I had a message saying spotlighted video is not going to be recorded. I don't know what that means. The participants video is highlighted. Yeah, you just highlighted my father. Did I? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm pretty sure I did not I did not that intentionally because I have no idea what that means. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I don't know if there are lots of, um, you know, uh, plant scientist um, parents in the crowd, but um, you can ask about how to influence children to become <laughs> <a> pathologists um, <laughs> in another session. Sure, sure. I mean, I don't know. My parents had nothing to do with botany. Um, I don't. I'm not sure if my son will want to be a botanist. We'll have to see. I'm sure I did not come up with a name as cool as yours. So I already failed there. But <laughs> I'm still hopeful. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> you never know. Yeah, we never know. But it's, that's very cool. That's very cool. And in Australia, wow, you definitely need to go over there for a while. 
Um, let's see, does anyone else have questions or would like to pick Juniper's brains about something? Um, so, or I mean, the, any feedback, really? I think with the, the soil metagenomics, especially, uh, I'm 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 finding it really hard. I think to decide even on, on sampling methods. So, I think anyone who has ever you know reviewed a paper and such, I don't know how how they would view it. Um, you know, to have basically just a, a couple of samples like as an ecologist again it just sounds wrong but apparently that's that's what people are doing because it's such a big data set like you you are getting everything from from that soil sample um and um even the sampling design you know um people have used these transacts and uh that sounds like it it's accepted again but because soil is so heterogenic, um, um, you know, every sampling point that I will be collecting from, like maybe if it's five centimeters the other way, I'm sampling a completely different community. So I find it like really tricky how to like get that whole sampling design to be really rigor rigorous without spending all my research money on, on sequencing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can't advise on that, but I think that's a symptom of when you're trying to do something new or in a different way, that then you don't always find other people's methods the most appropriate to your work for some reason, and then you kind of have to adjust. So just the fact that you're having these doubts and you're questioning just means you're doing something right. <laughs> you know, you're doing something new and it's good that you question and that you have these discussions. Now, I can't give you advice myself, but I <laughs> hope someone in the crowd can give you some tips. And in the end, I would always say, if you were my student, I would say just come up with a solution that makes sense to you. You know, I mean, <laughs> don't make something up from, <laughs> like <laughs> from zero, but of course, um, yeah, I mean, each project is different, so don't don't feel too guilty for questioning it or for trying to do something different because each each project has its own way uh, of working, its own research questions. Maybe you'll just uh, come up with a new method that someone will cite, you know? <laughs> Arthur, oh, Arthur, yes. Yeah, this is not uh, soil metagenomics um, question. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, one of your... Uh, one a prior work on chicken litter and the results were not conclusive? Uh, so it increased uh, the yield, but the farmers didn't like the taste of the sweet potatoes afterwards. Um, yeah, because I think one of the direct results of chicken litter application is you add a lot of phosphorus depending on, you know, the amount, you know, and how long it's been processed. It may be raw chicken litter or it may be sort of dry. It so, dry, yeah. and interesting to see is like where the all the land races responding similarly, were they high and low yielders? So that'd be interesting thing to look at. Yeah, I think with the land races, um, again, when I keep looking at you know the the sampling design, if I want a whole other land race to be included, everything doubles, um, which just makes everything really tricky. But I. You know, if if I had unlimited resources, um, I, I would love to compare the different land races and even the like transplantation. I think that's how I, I first started the whole experiment. That let's look at lowland um, um, varieties, highland varieties, grow them at two different locations uh, as well. Um, so my right. suggestion would be to gain an understanding of their basic response because you you know you can't deal with the uh, hundred you know entries in a trial. So my suggestion would be do an initial work to see how they respond to a certain level of phosphorus, and if some of these lines are higher yielding versus others, then you can almost group them into high yieldings to phosphorus inputs, and then just take one. So that will simplify your experimental work to a more manageable level because you can obviously you know screen a lot of of lines or genotypes. Yeah, that would be my suggestion to, to, to start, you know, to start there. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've been looking into, um, there's a, a modeling, the QEUSF, I think, or something like that. 
That's for um, uh, site-specific nutrient requirement measurement in the tropics. Uh, and there is one that has been measured for sweet potatoes and it is like a, a really neat design that like first you just add nitrogen, then P, then K, and then, you know, you do all the different factor factorials. Um, uh, but would be another chapter in your dissertation, you know, to calibrate it for Papua New Guinea conditions. There you go. So I would love it. Uh, I think <laughs> <laughs> I will go back to my supervisors. That, hey, I, I have, have another your... chapter. <laughs> yes. Chapter number twelve. Um, that would be neat. Yeah. Uh, that would be really neat. I think um, that there are some Australian projects going on, which are going on in controlled environments uh, with NARI, with the National Agricultural um, Institute. So the, those are the people that kind of can do the, the controlled bits. I think we keep on focusing on working with farmers in the field. Um, but that that would be, again, something fantastic. I, I'm not quite sure how much research is done at NARI um, and, um, you know, what is the, the level and um, everything. I've been just told that all these fertilizer um, experiments seem to just have really variable responses in PNG. So, like, that's why people haven't been able to suggest one thing for farmers because there's just so many things going on. It is variable because there's gaps in our understanding of how the roots respond. And that's an opportunity for you. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I was told, uh, I was talking with a professor and he started telling me that, okay, midway through my PhD, I sh should start looking for postdocs because I'm not going to finish. <laughs> yeah, you, you need a crowd of postdocs to help you out because three yeah. three years and the amount of work you program, you know, you probably need another couple of years to change the world there. So <laughs> good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I no, Start with master's students so that they're about to go into a PhD when you're finished, then you can supervise them as PhD when you're a postdoc. You have to start training them now to work with you on those lines. I'm planning on taking over, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a good place to recruit. So any students out there looking for a supervisor in three or four years? <laughs> Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, Juniper, actually, so uh, because we, I mean, we're going to have to to wrap up soonish because we need to jump on to our consortium meeting afterwards. Um, so I would just like to ask, uh, how do we get in touch with you? Then if people are seeing your presentation, say, oh, I want to follow up with what she's doing. So you have a project website, right? Can you just show that to us perhaps? Or um, So I can share the link um, in the chat if people have access actually i figured out how you can get access to the chat even if you're logged in as guest if you have a Tell separate us. window um where you have the the big teams bit and you are logged into the channel itself then you will have access to the channel it will, it will just see, say that the meeting is in progress and after that you can access the um the chat um and I would say because my email is a bit complicated, I'm happy to answer on Twitter, uh, but I'm also happy to um, share my email. My laptop is a bit slow, sorry. It's okay, or if you give us some uh, link to a website, because you've got some science communication stuff going on as well. Feel free to just drop it on the, on the chat now, if you don't mind, like whatever things you could offer for people to follow up with the cool stuff that you do. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's juniperkiss.com, I think. That's my website. Um, if you would like to have a look. Um, and my Twitter handle is goes by juniper. And my email is bk1u13. S O T O N dot A C dot U K. I got lost. You're gonna have to do that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, 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 I was typing as I was listening. Um, I tried. Uh, so thank you so much again for all the feedback, and uh, I saw the.
someone said that I have a couple of slides about bananas. I'm really happy to talk about bananas for a really long time. I love bananas and brambles. Um, if so, whenever you'd like to, um, I can share those couple of slides maybe later. Um, yeah, well, what we can do, I can stop the recording if that's okay. Because there you go.